Chapter 20, the United States and the World at War, 1913 to 1920. Individual Choices, Charles Young. In 1917, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Young was the highest ranking African-American in the US Army. Like other aspects of American life, the Army was segregated. When the US went to war against Germany, many African-Americans expected Young to command a division made up of the four black regular Army regiments and to take a prominent role in the war in Europe. Young also wanted to do this. He was a patriotic army officer eager to carry out the duties for which he had prepared, but he also wanted to show that a black commanding officer and black soldiers were as capable as white troops of confronting an enemy under fire. Growing up in Ohio, the son of former slaves, Young considered his father's Union Army service as a heritage of honor and secured an appointment to West Point through his academic accomplishments. After graduating, he was assigned to the 10th Cavalry, one of the army's two black cavalry units. He later taught military science at Wilberforce University in Xenia, Ohio, a leading black university. During the war with Spain, Young commanded a battalion of black volunteers, but his unit was not sent into action. He was then assigned to the 9th Cavalry and sent to the Philippines to help supply, suppress excuse me, the resistance to American rule. Afterward, he received diplomatic assignments in Haiti and Liberia. In 1913, he was back with the 10th Cavalry and participated in Pershing's expedition into Mexico, discussed later in this chapter. As a major, Young was superior to several white officers, some of whom complained about taking orders from an African American. When the war with Germany came, Young, now a lieutenant colonel, hoped to command. However, all four black units in the regular army were assigned to duties far from Europe, and Young was given a medical retirement. Unwilling to accept that status, Young rode his horse nearly 500 miles to prove his physical fitness. He was returned to active duty and promoted to colonel, but too late to take part in the war. In 1919, he was again assigned to diplomatic duty again in Liberia. He died there of a kidney infection in 1923. Young's experience was part of larger patterns of discrimination against African Americans. Though a capable and experienced officer, he was often given teaching or diplomatic duties rather than command of troops, most likely to prevent him from giving orders to white officers. It must have seemed deeply ironic for Young and other African Americans to read that President Wilson defined the war as a struggle for, quote, the principle of justice to all peoples and nationalities and their right to live on equal terms of liberty and safety with one another. In 1919, when asked about plans for a monument to African Americans who had died in the military, Young may have been reflecting on Wilson's statement when he suggested that the most fitting commemoration would not be a monument, but instead liberty, justice, equal opportunities in educational facilities, the suppression of lynching by making it a federal crime, and the abolition of segregated railroad cars. On June 28th of 1914, a Serbian terrorist killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, and his wife Sophie, who were visiting Sarajevo. That city was part of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which Austria had recently annexed, meaning they took it over by force, against the wishes of the neighboring kingdom of Serbia. In response to the assassinations, Austria consulted its ally Germany, then made stringent demands on Serbia. Serbia sought help from Russia, which was allied with France. Tense diplomat diplomats invoked elaborate interlocking alliances. Huge armies began to move. Soon, most of Europe was at war. Before those events, many Americans had concluded the war among what Theodore Roosevelt called the world's civilized nations had become unthinkable. Given the widely held expectation the war had become obsolete, many Americans were shocked, saddened, and repelled when the leading, quote, civilized nations of the world, all of which had been busily accumulating arsenals, lurched into war. Basically, people are surprised the war could happen again like this. When the nation's fear went to war, the U.S. was no minor, minor player on the international scene. Between 1898 and 1908, America acquired the Philippines and the Panama Canal, came to dominate the Caribbean and Central America, think about things like the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, and actively participated in the balance of power in Eastern Asia, think the Open Door Notes, think Japan. The three presidents of the Progressive Era, Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, agreed wholeheartedly that the U.S. should exercise a major role in world affairs. Inherited commitments in new directions, considering the one question, in what new directions did Wilson steer US foreign policy before the coming of the war in Europe? When Woodrow Wilson entered the White House in 1913, he expected to spend most of his time on domestic issues. Although well-read on international affairs, he had neither significant international experience nor set foreign policies. For Secretary of State, he chose William Jennings Bryan, who had also devoted his political career to domestic matters and had little experience in foreign relations. Both were devout Presbyterians, sharing a confidence that God had a plan for humankind and specifically for the United States. Both hoped, uh, perhaps naively, that they might make the U.S. a model among nations for peaceful settlement of international disputes. Initially, Wilson fixed his attention on the three regions of greatest American involvement, Latin America, the Pacific, and Eastern Asia. 
There, he tried to balance the anti-imperialist principles of his Democratic Party against the expansionist practices of his Republican predecessors. He marked out some new directions, but in the end, he extended many previous commitments. So he's really not a departure from what previous presidents did. Anti-imperialism, intervention, and arbitration. Wilson's Democratic Party had opposed many of the foreign policies of McKinley, Roosevelt, and Taft, especially imperialism. Secretary of State Bryan was a leading anti-imperialist who had criticized Roosevelt's big stick in foreign affairs. During the Wilson administration, Democrats took limited action against imperialism. In 1916, Congress established a Bill of Rights for residents of the Philippines, provided more autonomy, and promised eventual independence that would come right after World War II. The next year, Congress made Puerto Rico an American territory and extended American citizenship to its residents. Although Democrats had criticized Roosevelt's actions in the Caribbean, Wilson intervened more, than, more in Central America and the Caribbean than any previous administration. In Nicaragua, where Taft had sent Marines to prop up the rule of President Adolfo Diaz, Wilson sent more, sought more authority for the U.S. Senate Democrats rejected his efforts, reminding him of their party's opposition to further protectorates. Even so, Bryan negotiated a treaty in 1914 that gave the U.S. significant concessions, including the right to build a canal through Nicaragua. Haiti's government was unstable and owned, owed a staggering debt to foreign bankers. When a mob killed the president in 1915, Wilson sent in the Marines. A treaty followed, making Haiti a protectorate in which American forces controlled most aspects of government until 1933. Wilson sent Marines into the Dominican Republic in 1916, and U.S. naval officers exercised control there until 1924. In 1917, the U.S. brought the Virgin Islands from Denmark for $25 million. Thus, rather than changing previous policies, Wilson's administration significantly extended American dominance in the Caribbean. Again, this is an extension of previous policies. He's not a departure. He's an extension, even though he's a different political party. Wilson and Bryan did, however, bring a new approach to the arbitration of international disputes. That means figuring out disputes. Roosevelt's and Taft's secretaries of state had sought arbitration treaties, but the Senate refused to accept them. Bryan drafted a model treaty and first obtained approval from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The Senate ultimately ratified treaties with 22 nations. All featured a cooling off period for disputes, typically a year, during which the nations agreed to seek arbitration instead of going to war. These treaties marked the beginning of efforts by Wilson to redefine international relations, substituting rational negotiations for raw power. Wilson and the Mexican Revolution. I would recommend having note paper ready to keep track of the many different names and people who you're going to hear. In Mexico, Wilson attempted to influence internal politics, but eventually found himself on the verge of war. Porfirio Diaz had ruled Mexico for a third of a century, supported by great landholders, the church, and the military. During Diaz's rule, many American companies invested in Mexico. However, discontent among peasants, workers, and intellectuals boiled over into rebellion. Diaz resigned in 1911. Francisco Madero, a leading advocate of reform, became president but failed to unite the country. Conservatives feared, feared Madero as a reformer, but radicals found him too timid. In some places, peasant armies demanding tierra y libertad, land and liberty, attacked the mansions of great landowners. In February of 1913, conservatives joined with the commander of the army, General Victoriano Huerta, to overthrow Madero. Huerta took control of the government and had Madero executed. Most European governments extended diplomatic recognition to Huerta because his government clearly held power in Mexico City. Wilson faced that decision soon after his inauguration. American companies with investments in Mexico urged recognition because Huerta seemed likely to support their holdings. Wilson, however, privately vowed not to recognize a government of butchers. In public, Wilson announced he withheld recognition because Huerta's regime did not rest on the consent of the governed. Wilson's addition of an ethical dimension to diplomatic recognition constituted something totally new in foreign policy. Previous presidents had automatically extended diplomatic recognition to governments in power. Wilson's approach, sometimes labeled missionary diplomacy, implied that the United States would discriminate between virtuous and corrupt governments. Telling one visitor, I am going to teach the South American republics to elect good men, Wilson waited for an opportunity to act against Huerta. In the meantime, anti-Huerta forces led by Venustiano Carranza made significant gains. In April 1914, Mexican officials in Tampico arrested some, Mex some American sailors. The city's army commander immediately released them and apologized, but Wilson used the incident to justify ordering the U.S. Navy to occupy Veracruz, the leading Mexican port and the major source of the Huerta government's revenue from customs. The occupation cut off most government military supplies. However, it cost more than 100 Mexican lives and turned many Mexicans against Wilson for violating their sovereignty. 
Without munitions and revenue, we were to flood the country in mid-July. Wilson withdrew the last American forces from Veracruz in November of that year. Carranza succeeded Huerta as president, and Wilson officially recognized his government. Carranza, however, faced armed opposition from Francisco Pancho Villa in northern Mexico and Emiliano Zapata in the south. When Villa suffered setbacks, he apparently decided to involve Carranza in a war with the U.S. Villa's Maria's, excuse me, men surrendered, murdered, I'm going to start over, Villa's men murdered several Americans in Mexico and then in March of 1916 raided across the border and killed several Americans in New Mexico. With Carranza's reluctant approval, Wilson sent an expedition of nearly 7,000 men, commanded by General John J. Pershing, we'll see him again in World War I, into Mexico to punish Villa. Villa evaded the American troops but drew them ever deeper into Mexico, alarming Carranza. When a clash between Mexican government forces and American soldiers produced deaths on both sides, Carranza asked Wilson to withdraw his troops. Wilson refused. Only in early 1917, when Wilson recognized that America might soon go to war with Germany, did he withdraw the troops from Mexico, leaving behind resentment and suspicion towards the United States. We never did get Pancho Villa down there, no matter how much traipsing around Pershing is going to do. Uh, he evades us. The U.S. and the Great War, 1914 to 1917. Considering the questions, why did Wilson proclaim American neutrality? How did Americans respond? What made neutrality difficult? And how did Wilson justify going to war? At first, Americans paid little attention to the assassination at Sarajevo. When Europe plunged into war, however, Wilson and all Americans faced difficult choices. The Great War in Europe. Within the ethnically diverse empires of Austria, Hungary, Russia, and Turkey, many groups hoped for independence based on language and culture. Ethnic antagonisms and aspirations were especially powerful in the Balkan Peninsula, where the Ottoman Turkish Empire had lost territory as several groups had established their independence. Some of the new Balkan states were weak, attracting the neighboring Austrian and Russian empires. As Austria-Hungary sought to annex new territories, Russia claimed the role of protector of other Slavic peoples. Slavic, by the way, um, that means linguistic groups, mainly in Eastern and Central Europe, including Croats, Czechs, Poles, Russians, Serbs, Slovaks, and others. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, competition among European powers seeking world markets and territory spawned an unprecedented arms buildup. By the 1870s, Germany had the most powerful army in Europe and set out to make its navy as powerful as Britain's. Technology produced new and powerful weapons, including the machine gun, and designers quickly adapted automobiles and airplanes for combat. The major powers of Europe had avoided war with one another since 1871, but they continued to prepare for war. Eventually, European diplomats constructed two major alliance systems. You have the Triple Entente with Britain, France, and Russia, and the Triple Alliance with Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Britain was also allied with Japan. The way to keep those separate, by the way, Triple Entente is the one with France, and Entente kind of sounds like a French word to me. So Triple Entente, again, is Britain, France, and Russia, and the Triple Alliance is Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Called the powder kick of Europe, the Balkans lived up to the nickname in 1914. The assassinations at Sarajevo grew out of a territorial conflict between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. Russia, alarmed over Austrian expansion into the Balkans, presented itself as the protector of Serbia. Austria assured itself of Germany's backing, and then they declared war on Serbia. Russia confirmed France's support, then mobilized its own army in support of Serbia. Germany declared war on Russia on August 1st and on France soon after. German strategists planned to bypass French defenses, so to basically go around them, along their border by invading neutral Belgium. Britain entered the war in defense of Belgium. By August 4th, much of Europe was at war. Eventually, Germany and Austria-Hungary combined with Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire to form the Central Powers. Italy also abandoned the Triple Alliance and joined Britain, France, Russia, Romania, and Japan as the allies. At first, Secretary of State Bryan tried to take a hopeful view of events in Europe. It may be he suggested that the world needed one more awful object lesson to prove conclusively the fallacy of the doctrine that preparedness for war can give assurance for peace. Sir Edward Grey, Britain's foreign minister, was less optimistic as he mourned to a friend, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Grey proved a more accurate prophet than Brian. The Germans expected to roll through Belgium and quickly defeat France. The Belgians, however, resisted long enough for French and British, troop, British troops to block the Germans. The opposing armies settled into defensive lines across 475 miles of Belgian and French countryside, extending from the English Channel all the way to the Alps. By the end of 1914, the Western Front consisted of elaborate networks of trenches on both sides, separated by a desolate no man's land, filled with coils of barbed wire, where any movement brought a burst of machine gun fire. 
As the war progressed, terrible new weapons, poison gas, aerial bombs, tanks, took thousands of lives but failed to break the deadlock caused by the trenches. American neutrality. Wilson's initial reaction to the European conflagration revealed his own deep religious beliefs. He wrote privately that Providence has deeper plans than we could possibly have laid for ourselves. After announcing US neutrality on August 4th, he urged Americans to be neutral in fact as well as in name, impartial in thought as well as in action. That doesn't really happen. Wilson hoped both that America would remain neutral and that he might serve as peacemaker. Such hopes proved unrealistic. The warring nations wanted to gain territory and only a decisive victory could accomplish that. The longer they fought, the more territory they wanted. So long as they saw a chance of winning, they had no interest in the appeals of would-be peacemakers. Basically, they want to keep fighting until they get what they want. Wilson's hope that Americans could remain impartial was also unrealistic. Although few Americans wanted to go to war, most sided with the Allies. England had cultivated American friendship for decades, and trade and finance united many of their business leaders. French assistance during the American Revolution also helped to fuel support for France. And the martyrdom of Belgium aroused American sympathy. Remember that Belgium was neutral, but Germany went through Belgium to get into France. So that story sort of makes us feel sympathetic toward Belgium. Allied propagandists worked hard to generate anti-German sentiment, publicizing and exaggerating German atrocities and portraying the war as a conflict between civilized people and barbarian Huns. Huns, by the way, that is a disparaging term applied to Germans during World War I, derived from warlike people who invaded Europe in the fourth and fifth centuries. Not all Americans sympathized with the Allies. Nearly 8 million out of the 97 million people in the United States had one or both parents from Germany or Austria. Not surprisingly, many of them rejected de de depictions of their cousins as bloodthirsty barbarians. Many of the 5 million Irish Americans also disliked England for ruling... So sorry about that. Disliked England for ruling their ancestral homeland. Neutral rights and German U-boats. Wilson and Bryan agreed that the U.S. should remain neutral, but took different approaches to that goal. Bryan proved willing to sacrifice traditional neutral rights if insistence on those rights seemed likely to pull the U.S. into the conflict. Wilson, in contrast, stood firm on maintaining traditional neutral rights, a posture that actually favored the Allies because we're doing a lot of business with them. Bryan initially opposed loans to belligerent nations as incompatible with neutrality. A belligerent nation is a nation at war. Bryan's stance was basically, you can't say you're neutral if you're giving loans to countries who are at war. Wilson agreed, then realized that this ban on trading hurt the Allies more. He then allowed buying goods on credit. Eventually, he dropped the ban on loans, partly because neutrals had always been permitted to lend to belligerents, and partly, perhaps, because the freeze endangered the stability of the American economy. If we're not going to be trading at all with Europe, that's really going to hurt our economy. Traditional neutral rights included freedom of the seas. Neutrals could trade with all belligerents. When both sides turned to naval warfare to break the deadlock on the Western Front, Wilson found himself defending the rights of neutral shippings to both Britain and Germany. Britain commanded the seas and tried to redefine neutral rights by blockading German ports and neutral ports from which goods could reach Germany, and by expanding definitions of contraband to include anything that might indirectly aid Germany, even cotton and food. Contraband, by the way, is defined as goods prohibited from being imported or exported. In a time of war, contraband includes materials of war, so think like guns and ammunition. Um, but here we see that expansion, or excuse me, that definition being expanded to include anything that might aid Germany, even cotton and food. Britain also extended the right of belligerent nations to stop and search neutral ships for contraband by insisting that large modern ships could not be searched at sea and must be escorted to port, thus imposing costly delays. Germany also challenged neutral rights, declaring a blockade of the British Isles to be enforced by its submarines called U-boats. Because U-boats were relatively fragile, a lightly armed merchant ship might sink one that surfaced and ordered the merchant ship to stop in the traditional manner. Consequently, Submarines struck from below without warning. When Britain began disguising its ships by flying the flags of neutral countries, Germany declared that even neutral flags no longer guaranteed protection from their U-boats. Wilson issued token protests over Britain's practices, but strongly denounced those of Germany. Because Germany's violations of neutrality produced loss of life, basically Germans' violations killed people, uh, he considered them significantly different from Britain's, which caused only financial hardship. On February 10, 1915, Wilson warned that the U.S. would hold Germany to strict accountability for its actions and would do everything necessary to safeguard American lives and property and to maintain American neutral rights. On May 7, 1915, a German U-boat torpedoed the British passenger ship Lusitania. More than 1,000 people died, including 128 Americans. Americans reacted with shock and horror. 
Upon learning that the Lusitania carried ammunition and other contraband, not just innocent people, Brian urged restraint in protesting to Germany. Basically, he kind of sees it a little bit from Germany's perspective. Here's the ship that was actually carrying things that were meant to help Britain for war. Wilson, however, sent a strong message that stopped just short of demanding an end to submarine attacks on merchant ships. When the German response was non-committal, Wilson composed an even stronger protest. Fearing that Wilson's message would lead to war, Bryan resigned as Secretary of State rather than sign it. Robert Lansing, Bryan's successor as Secretary of State, strongly favored the Allies. Where Bryan had counseled restraint, Lansing urged a show of strength. U-boat attacks continued. Wilson sent more protests, but he knew most Americans opposed going to war over that issue. Finally, he warned Germany that if unrestricted submarine warfare did not stop, the U.S. would sever diplomatic relations, which was the last step before declaring war. Germany responded that U-boats would no longer strike non-combatant vessels without warning, provided that Wilson convinced the Allies to obey international law. Wilson accepted the pledge, but did little to persuade the British to change their tactics. The war strengthened America's economic ties to the Allies, to put it lightly. Exports to Britain and France soared from 756 million in 1914 to 2.7 billion in 1916. American companies exported $6 million worth of explosives in 1914 and 467 million in 1916. Even more significantly, the U.S. changed from a debtor to a creditor nation. A creditor nation, by the way, is a nation whose citizens or government has loaned more money to the citizens or governments of other nations than the total amount they've borrowed from the citizens or governments of other nations. So basically, we loan a lot more money. By 1917, American bankers had loaned the Allies more than $2 billion. However, the British blockade stifled Americans' trade with the Central Powers, which fell from around $170 million in 1914 to almost nothing two years later. Wilson concluded that the best way to maintain American neutrality was to end the war. He sent his closest confidant, Edward M. House, to London and Berlin in early 1916 to present proposals for peace and for a League of Nations to maintain peace in the future. House received no encouragement from either side and concluded that they were not interested in negotiations. Some Americans had begun to demand preparedness, a military buildup. In response, in mid-1916, Congress appropriated the largest naval expenditures in peacetime history and approved the National Defense Act, which doubled the size of the Army. Wilson accepted both measures. The election of 1916. By embracing preparedness, Wilson defused an issue that might have helped the Republicans in the 1916 presidential campaign. The Democrats nominated Wilson for a second term, and they campaigned on their domestic reforms and preparedness programs, frequently repeating the slogan, he kept us out of war. Republicans nominated Charles Evans Hughes, a Supreme Court justice and former governor of New York with a reputation as a progressive. Hughes avoided a clear position on preparedness and neutrality, hoping for support from both German Americans upset with Wilson's harshness towards Germany and from those who wanted maximum assistance for the allies. As a result, he failed to present a compelling alternative to Wilson. The vote was very close. Most voters identified themselves as Republicans and Wilson needed support from some of them. He won by uniting the always Democratic South with the West, much of which was progressive. Wilson also received significant backing from unions, socialists, and women in states where women could vote. In the end, Wilson received 49% of the vote to 46% for Hughes. The decision for war. After the election, events moved quickly. In January 1917, Wilson spoke to the Senate to the need to achieve and preserve peace. The galleries were packed as he called for an international organization to keep peace in the future. He urged that the only lasting peace would be a, quote, peace without victory, in which neither side exacted gains from the other. He called for government by consent of the governed, freedom of the seas, and reductions in armaments. Wilson aimed a speech toward the people of the countries now at war, hoping to build public pressure on those governments to seek peace. He won praise from left-wing opposition parties in several countries, but the British, French, and German governments had no interest in peace without victory. In fact, the German government decided to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, fully expecting this would bring the U.S. into the war, but gambling that they would defeat the British and French before American troops could make a difference. When Germany announced it was resuming unrestricted submarine warfare, Wilson broke off diplomatic relations. German U-boats began immediately de to devastate Atlantic shipping. A few weeks later, on March 1st, Wilson released a message from the German State Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Arthur Zimmerman, to, to the German minister in Mexico. Zimmerman proposed that if the U.S. went to war with Germany, Mexico should join with Germany and attack the U.S. Zimmerman pr promised that if Germany and Mexico won, Mexico would recover its lost provinces of Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico, areas that it had lost in 1848. 
Zimmerman also proposed that Mexico should encourage Japan to enter the war against the US. The British intercepted the message and gave it to Wilson. Zimmerman's suggestions further outraged Americans. Definitely know the Zimmerman telegram, definitely know the Zimmerman note. Very key APUSH content right there. By March 21st, German U-boats had sunk six American ships. Wilson could avoid war only by backing down from his insistence on strict accountability, and he did not retreat. Despite his focus on neutral rights, Wilson's major objective in going to war was to defeat American or German autocracy and militarism, and to put the US and himself in a position to determine the terms of peace. On April 2nd, 1917, Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany and tried to unite Americans in a righteous, progressive crusade. Condemning German U-boat attacks as warfare against mankind, he proclaimed, the world must be made safe for democracy. He promised that the U.S. would fight for self-government, the rights and liberties of small nations, and a league of nations to bring peace and safety to all nations and to make the world itself at last free. Not all members of Congress agreed the war was necessary. During the debate, Senator George W. Norris, a progressive Republican from Nebraska, best voiced the opposing arguments. The nation, he argued, was going to war upon the command of gold to preserve the commercial right of American citizens to deliver new munitions of war to belligerent nations. In the Senate, um, Norris, Robert LaFollette, and four others voted no, but 82 senators voted for war. Jeanette Rankin of Montana, the first woman in the House of Representatives, was among those who said no when the House voted 373 to 50 for war. In December, Congress also declared war against Austria-Hungary. So to recap real fast, the sinking of the Lusitania and the Zimmerman note definitely make Americans angry and they absolutely push us more onto the side of the allies, but those really aren't the reason why we go to war. Um, on paper, at least, we declare war because of unrestricted submarine warfare. That's really the proximal, the closest and the most relevant cause for American entrance into World War I. Now to skip over to a deeper understanding of history, a history detective at work. Between 1924 and 1967, more than two dozen accounts of Woodrow Wilson's decision to go to war cited a conversation between Wilson and Frank Cobb, editor of the New York World. In this conversation, Wilson expressed deep misgivings about going to war and was highly prophetic about what war would mean for civil liberties, progressivism, and his own political future. In 1967, a young assistant professor, Gerald Auerbach, published an article in which he argued persuasively that such a conversation never actually took place. This conversation that historians have based so much thought on never took place, he says. His study provides both a warning to scholars about the need to be critical of sources and an excellent example of detective work by a historian. Auerbach began by tracking the account of the conversation to a book that was published in 1924. However, the account in that book was not written by Cobb, but by two of his colleagues, Maxwell Anderson and Lawrence Stallings, and it was written after Cobb's death, seven years after that alleged conversation had occurred. Anderson and Stallings claimed that Cobb told them the story and that they had reproduced it, complete with long, exact quotations from Wilson from memory. Auerbach points out that it would have been difficult for Cobb or his two colleagues to have recalled the exact words of Wilson so many years later. Auerbach also points out that there is no evidence that Cobb even visited the White House within two weeks of the supposed date of the conversation. Anderson and Stallings quote Wilson as voicing deep misgivings for civil liberties should the nation go to war. Auerbach, however, produces ample evidence that Wilson himself repeatedly took public positions that were, in Auerbach's phrase, emphatically anti-libertarian. And he points out that Wilson did nothing to protect civil liberties either before or during the war. Auerbach carefully examines the language attributed to Wilson by Anderson and Stallings and concludes that it is so exact a statement of what actually transpired between 1917 and 1920 that one is almost forced to conclude that it was written after those years, not before. For example, he notes that Wilson supposedly predicted the general outline of the Versailles Conference. Finally, Auerbach reveals that Anderson and Stallings were, by 1924, deeply disillusioned by the war. So maybe they had some reason to look back and to say that the American president, that Wilson, had maybe also had misgivings. Auerbach presents his conclusions in the title of his article, What Are Wilson's Prediction of Frank Cobb? Words Historians Should Doubt Ever Got Spoken. Not all historians accept Auerbach's conclusion, but you can read his article and decide for yourself. See the Journal of American History, Volume 54, 1967. A subsequent article by Brian J. Dalton in The Historian, Volume 32 in 1970, presents additional information and comes to a different conclusion. Both journals are available through most college and university libraries, and if you're interested, I would love to help you find them. The home front, considering the questions, how successful was the federal government in mobilizing the economy and society to support the war? And how did the war affect Americans, especially women, African-Americans, and opponents of war? 
Historians call World War I the first total war because it was the first to demand mobilization of an entire society and economy. The war altered nearly every aspect of the economy as the progressive emphasis on expertise and efficiency produced unprecedented centralization of economic decision making. Mobilization extended far beyond war production to people themselves and to shaping public opinion about the war. Mobilizing the economy. Waging war effectively depended on a fully engaged industrial economy and all the warring nations sought to redirect economic activities towards supplying their war machines. In the US, railway transportation delays, shortages of supplies, and the sluggish pace of some manufacturing led to increased federal direction over transportation, food and fuel production, and manufacturing. Basically, the government steps in to help make sure everything runs smoothly. This was not unusual among the belligerents and was probably less extreme than in other nations. Even so, the extent of direct federal control over much of the economy has never been matched since World War I. Though unprecedented, much of the government intervention was voluntary. Business enlisted as a partner with government and supplied its cooperation and expertise. Some prominent entrepreneurs volunteered their services for a dollar a year. Much of the wartime centralization of economic decision making came through new agencies composed of government officials, business leaders, and prominent citizens. The War Industries Board supervised production of war materials. At first, it had only limited success in increasing productivity. Then, in early 1918, Wilson appointed Bernard Baruch, a Wall Street financier, to head the board, the War Industries Board. By pleading, bargaining, and sometimes threatening, Baruch usually persuaded companies to meet production quotas, allocate raw materials, develop new industries, and streamline operations. Although Baruch threatened steel company executives with a government takeover, he accomplished most goals without coercion, and industrial production increased by 20% thanks to his work with the War Industries Board. Efforts to conserve fuel included the first use of daylight savings times. To improve rail transportation, the federal government consolidated the railroads and ran them during the war. Oh my goodness, if only the, the Grangers could see it now. The government also took over the telegraph and telephone systems and launched a huge shipbuilding program to expand the merchant marine. The National War Labor Board, NWLB, created in 1918, endorsed collective bargaining in order to facilitate production by resolving labor disputes. Collective bargaining, by the way, is negotiation between the representatives of organized workers and their employers to determine wages, hours, and working conditions. The board also helped to settle labor disputes. Never before had a federal agency interceded this way. The board gave some support for an eight-hour workday in return for a no-strike pledge from unions. Most unions promised not to strike for the duration of the war, and many secured contracts with significant wage increases. Union membership boomed from 2.7 million in 1916 to more than 4 million by 1919. Samuel Gompers, president of the AFL, called the war the most wonderful crusade ever entered upon in the whole history of the world. Nevertheless, many workers felt that their purchasing power was not keeping pace with increases in prices. Demands for increased production when millions of men went marching off to war opened opportunities for women. Employment of women in factory, office, and retail jobs had increased before the war, and the war accelerated those trends. At the war's end, many women's wartime jobs returned to male hands, but in office work and some retail positions, women continued to dominate after the war. So basically, women will take some jobs that men had during World War I, but after the war, most of those jobs are going to go right back to men. One crucial American contribution to the Allies was food, for the war severely disrupted European agriculture. Wilson appointed as food administrator Herbert Hoover, who had already won wide praise for directing the relief program in Belgium when America was still neutral. Now he both promoted increased food production and urged families to conserve food through meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays and by planting war gardens to raise vegetables. Farmers brought large, large areas under cultivation for the first time. Food shipments to the Allies tripled. This is, by the way, of course, future President Herbert Hoover, who's president when the Great Depression happens, or when it begins. Some progressives urged that the Wilson administration pay for the war by taxing the wartime profits and earnings of corporations. That did not happen, but taxes, especially the new income tax, did account for almost half of the $33 billion the United States spent on the war between April 1917 and June of 1920. The government borrowed the rest, much of it through Liberty Loan drives. Liberty Loans, by the way, there were four different bonds, uh, bond issues floated by the U.S. Treasury Department from 1917 to 1919 that helped to finance World War I. Rallies, parades, and posters pushed all Americans to buy Liberty Bonds. Mobilizing public opinion. Not all Americans supported the war. Some German Americans were reluctant to send their sons to war against their cousins. Some Irish Americans became even more hostile to Britain after English troops brutally suppressed an attempt at Irish independence in 1916. 
the Socialist Party openly opposed the war, and Socialist candidates dramatically increased their share of the vote in several places in 1917 to 22% in New York City and 34% in Chicago, suggesting that their anti-war stance attracted many voters. To mobilize public opinion in support of the war, Wilson created the Committee on Public Information, the CPI, headed by George Creel. George Creel determined to sell the war to Americans. The Creel Committee eventually counted 150,000 lecturers, writers, artists, actors, and scholars championing the war and whipping up hatred of the Huns. Social clubs, movie theaters, and churches all joined what Creel called the world's greatest adventure in advertising. Four Minute Men, volunteers ready to make a short patriotic speech any time and place a crowd gathered, made 755,190 speeches. Wilson's war message had stressed that we have no quarrel with the German people, but wartime propaganda quickly moved toward demonizing all things German, and wartime patriotism sparked extreme measures against those considered slackers or those who others suspected being pro-German. Woe to the man or group of men that seeks to stand in our way, Ward Wilson. He who is not with us absolutely and without reserve of any kind, um, echoed former President Theodore Roosevelt, is against us and should be treated as an alien enemy. Americanization drives promoted rapid assimilation among immigrants. Some states prohibited the use of foreign languages in public. Officials removed German books from libraries and sometimes publicly burned them. Some communities banned music by Bach and Beethoven and dropped German classes from their schools. Even words became objectionable. Sauerkraut became liberty cabbage. Sometimes mobs hounded people with German names and occasionally attacked or even lynched people suspected of anti-war sentiments. A couple other ones that are fun, dachshunds became liberty hounds and German measles became liberty measles. Civil liberties in time of war. Not only German Americans, but also pacifists, socialists, and other radicals became targets for government repression and vigilante action. Vigilantes, by the way, are people who take law enforcement into their own hands, usually on the grounds that normal law enforcement has broken down or is incapable of serving justice in some way. Congress passed the Espionage Act in 1917 and the Sedition Act in 1918, prohibiting interference with the draft and outlawing criticism of the government, the armed forces, or the war effort. Violators faced large fines and long prison terms. Officials arrested 1,500 people for violating these acts, including Eugene V. Debs, leader of the Socialist Party. The Espionage Act authorized the Postmaster General to bar objectionable publications from the mail. By the war's end, he had denied mailing privileges to some 400 periodicals, including at least temporarily the New York Times and other mainstream publications because they're critical of the war effort in some way. When convictions under these acts were appealed to the Supreme Court, the court upheld the constitutionality of the laws. I'm gonna skip over right there and read Toward a More Perfect Union, Civil Liberties in Wartime. The Espionage and Sedition Acts were intended to silence critics of the war and to prevent them from interfering with mobilization. Charles Schenck was convicted of violating the Espionage Act for distributing leaflets that encouraged men to refuse the draft. He appealed to the US Supreme Court arguing that his actions were protected by the First Amendment. In 1918, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the First Amendment did not protect speech or writing that posed a danger to the nation. The decision by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes argued from analogy, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. In First Amendment cases, Holmes continued, the question must be whether the speech or writing in question creates a clear and present danger to the nation. He concluded that Shanks leaflets did indeed present a clear and present danger, they fit that description. In 1969, the Supreme Court modified the Schenck and related decisions when it specified that the First Amendment protected speech and writings unless they created the likelihood of, quote, imminent lawless action. The industrial workers of the world, the IWW, also called the Wobblies, made no public pronouncement against the war, but most Wobblies probably opposed it. Wobbly members and leaders quickly came under attack from employers, government officials, and vigilantes, most of whom had disliked the IWW before the war. In September of 1917, Justice Department agents raided Wobbly offices nationwide and arrested their leaders, who were sent to prison for up to 25 years and fined millions of dollars. Deprived of most leaders and virtually bankrupt, the IWW never recovered. And if you want, you can go Google Bisbee deportation right now to see some of the stuff they went through. Some Americans protested the abridgment of civil liberties. One group formed the Civil Liberties Bureau, forerunner of the American Civil Liberties Union. Most Americans, however, did not object to their oppression and many who did kept silent. The Great Migration and White Reactions. In 1910, about 90% of all African Americans lived in the South, 75% of them in rural areas. 
1920, as many as half a million had moved north in what had been called the Great Migration. Many went to industrial cities in the Midwest. New York City, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles also attracted many Blacks. Several factors produced this migration, but most important were the brutality and hardships of Southern life and the economic opportunities in Northern cities. Every time a lynching takes place in a community down South, said T. Arnold Hill of Chicago's Urban League, colored people will arrive in Chicago within two weeks. Equally significant in the, in the Great Migration was American industry's desperate need for workers. The labor needs of Northern cities attracted hundreds of thousands of African Americans seeking better jobs and higher pay. In the North, one could earn almost as much in a day as in a week in the South. African Americans did better, did find better wages, but also racial discrimination in housing and in access to many jobs. Basically, just because there wasn't slavery up north doesn't mean that there's not racism present. New Black neighborhoods developed in some cities where African Americans were able to find housing. Racial conflicts erupted in several northern cities as whites attacked individual African Americans or tried to burn their neighborhoods. One of America's worst race riots swept through the industrial city of East St. Louis, Illinois on July 2nd, 1917. Thousands of Black laborers, most from the South, had settled there during the previous two years. 39 African Americans perished in the riot and 6,000 lost their homes. In sense that such brutality could occur just weeks after the nation's moralistic entrance into the war, W.E.B. Du Bois charged, no land that loves to lynch Black people can lead the hosts of Almighty God, and the NAACP led a silent protest parade of 10,000 people through Harlem. Harlem, by the way, is a section of New York City in the northern part of Manhattan, and it's one of the largest Black communities in the United States at the time. This is going to be key in the 1920s. You've probably heard of the Harlem Renaissance. Stay tuned for that. Planning for peace in the midst of war. Considering the questions, what role did American ships and troops play in the war, and how and why did Wilson keep America's participation in the war separate from the Allies? Some who supported the war expected that the U.S. would send only supplies and not soldiers, but it quickly became clear that the U.S. needed to mobilize troops. The army, however, was tiny compared to the armies contesting in Europe. Millions of men and thousands of women had to be inducted, trained, and transported to Europe. Mobilizing for battle. The Navy was large and powerful after three decades of shipbuilding, and preparedness majors in 1916 further strengthened it. The American and British Navy's convoy technique, in which several cargo or passenger ships traveled together under the protection of destroyers, cut shipping costs in half, or losses, excuse me, in half. By spring of 1918, U-boats ceased to pose a significant danger. In April 1917, the combined strength of the U.S. Army and National Guard stood at 372,000 men. Many volunteered, uh, but many volunteered, but not enough. In May, Congress passed the Selective Service Act, the draft, requiring men between 21 and 30, later between ages 18 and 45, to register with local draft boards to determine who would be drafted, that is called duty. The law exempted those who opposed war on religious grounds, but such conscientious objectors were, uh, objectors were sometimes badly treated. Conscientious objectors, that's going to pop up again and again, especially in the Vietnam War, and that's defined as people who refuse to bear arms or participate in military service because of religious beliefs or moral principles. Few people demonstrated against the draft, and most seemed to accept it as efficient and fair. 24 million men registered and 2.8 million were drafted, making up about 72% of the entire army. By the end of the war, the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps counted 4.8 million members. No women were drafted, but almost 13,000 served in the Navy and Marines, most in clerical uh, capacities. For the first time, women held naval and Marine rank and status. The Army refused to enlist women, considering it too radical. Nearly 18,000 women served as Army nurses, but without Army rank or pay. At least 5,000 civilian women also served in France, the largest number through the Red Cross, which helped to staff hospitals and rest facilities. Nearly 400,000 African Americans served during World War I. Emmett J. Scott, an African American and former secretary to Booker T. Washington, became special assistant to the Secretary of War responsible for African Americans. Almost 200,000 served overseas. Most were assigned to menial tasks. Despite Charles Young's experience, nearly 30,000 African Americans fought on the front lines. Black soldiers were often treated as second-class citizens, serving in segregated units in the Army, limited to food service in the Navy, and excluded altogether from the Marines. More than 600 African Americans earned commissions as officers, but the Army refused to put a Black officer in authority over white officers. White officers commanded most Black troops. Americans over there. Shortly after the U.S. entered the war, a new song by George M. Cohan rocketed to national popularity. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. The Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, and we won't come back till it's over, over there. If you want, you can Google it and hear the song. I was not about to sing it. A few Yanks, troops in the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF, arrived in France in June of 1917, commanded by General John J. Pershing. 
recently returned from Mexico. Most American troops, however, were still to be inducted, supplied, trained, and transported across the Atlantic. Throughout the war, Wilson held the U.S. apart from the Allies. He referred to the U.S. not as one of the Allies, but as an associated power, and he insisted that American troops have their own sector on the Western Front. He did so because he distrusted Allied war aims, and he wanted to make sure that American contributions to victory were prominent as possible in order to maximize our influence at the peace conference. And it's worth noting the caption on the photo on 553, about 10,000 American Indians served in the army during World War I, including John Miller in the photo left and Charlie Wolf, members of the Omaha tribe. Some Indians who went to war first underwent tribal ceremonies long unpracticed that prepared warriors for battle, thus helping to preserve traditional customs. There were also Native American code talkers during World War I. I think everybody's aware of the Navajo code talkers in World War II, but World War I did also feature some Native American code talkers. As American troops trickled into France in mid-1917, the Allies were stretched thin. French and British offensives in 1917 failed, and the Italians suffered a major defeat later that year. After disastrous losses, Russia withdraw, withdrew from the war late in 1917, permitting German commanders to shift many troops to the Western Front. Hoping to win the war before Americans could make a difference, the Germans planned a massive offensive for spring of 1918. German troops smashed into the French and British lines in Picardy and advanced along the Marne River. By late May, the Germans were within 50 miles of Paris. As French officials considered evacuating the capital, all available troops, including AEF units, were rushed to the front. At Chateau Terry and at Belleau Wood, AEF troops took 8,000 casualties during a month-long battle over a single square mile of wheat fields and woods. Of 310,000 AEF troops who fought in the Marne region, 67,000 were killed or wounded. The German advance failed. The Allies then launched a counteroffensive in July as American troops poured into France, topping a million. In September, Pershing launched a successful offensive against the St. Mihail salient. AEF forces then joined an Allied offensive in the Meuse River Argonne Forest region, the last major assault of the war and one of the fiercest battles in American military history. On October 8th, Corporal Alvin York, a skilled sharpshooter from the Tennessee Mountains, was in the Argonne Forest. His unit came under fire and most were wounded or killed. York, however, coolly practiced his mountaineer sharpshooting, single-handedly killing 25 enemy soldiers and silencing 35 machine guns. He and the six surviving members of his unit took 132 prisoners. York received the Congressional Medal of Honor, the Croix de Guerre, France's highest decoration, and similar awards from other nations. York's courage and coolness were not unique among the Americans in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. Harry J. Adams, with only an empty pistol, captured 300 prisoners. Um, Hercules Corgia, captured, captured by the Germans, persuaded his captors to become his prisoners, and Samuel Woodville single-handedly took out five machine guns. German military leaders now urged an armistice. Fighting ended at 11 o'clock a.m. on November 11th of 1918. Nearly 9 million combatants had died. Germany lost 1.8 million, Russia 1.7 million, France 1.4 million, Austria-Hungary 1.1 million, and the British Empire 1.1 million. Of the 45 million who served in the French army, 31% were killed and 44% were wounded. American losses were small in comparison. We had 365,000 casualties. By the way, casualties include um, people who were lost through death, wounds, injury, sickness, or capture. Casualty is not always just a death, including 126,000 deaths. Some 800,000 civilians from the Central Powers died of famine resulting from the British blockade. Millions of other civilians worldwide died from war-related causes, including starvation and disease. A global influenza epidemic in 1918 and 1919 killed 20 to 40 million people, or perhaps more, more than died in the war and including 500,000 Americans. Weird to read about that right now. Some white Americans, including some military officers, worried that experiences in France might cause African-American soldiers to resist segregation at home. In August of 1918, AEF headquarters secretly requested that the French not prominently commend black units, basically telling the French not to compliment black units. The French, however, awarded the Croix de Guerre to several all-black units that had distinguished themselves in combat, and they presented awards to individual soldiers for acts of bravery and heroism. When the Allies staged a grand victory parade down, the, down Paris's Champs-Élysées, the British and French contingents included all races and ethnicities, but American commanders directed that no African-American troops could take part. Bolshevism, the secret treaties, and the 14 points. In March of 1917, before the US entered the war, war-weary and hungry Russians deposed their czar and created a provisional government. To depose means to kick out of office. 
In November, a group of radical socialists called the Bolsheviks seized power. Soon renamed communists, the Bolsheviks condemned capitalism and imperialism and sought to destroy them. Vladimir Lenin, the Bolshevik leader, initiated peace negotiations with the Germans. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in March of 1918 was harsh and humiliating, requiring Russia to surrender vast territories, Finland, its Baltic provinces, parts of Poland and Ukraine, a third of its population, half of its industries, its most fertile agricultural land, and a quarter of its territory in Europe. That is a lot. The Bolsheviks condemned the war as a scramble for imperial spoils. In December of 1917, they published the secret treaties by which the Allies had agreed to divide colonies and territories of the defeated central powers among themselves. These exposés strengthened Wilson's intent to keep American war aims separate and to impose his own war objectives on the Allies. On January 8, 1918, Wilson spoke to Congress. He denounced both the secret treaties and the harsh terms the Germans were demanding from Russia. American war goals, he proclaimed, derived from the principle of justice to all peoples and national nationalities and the right to live on equal terms of liberty and safety with one another, whether they be strong or weak. Seeking to seize the initiative, he presented 14 objectives soon called the 14 points. You should absolutely know the 14 points. A big overall definition is President Wilson's statement of US war goals, including arms reductions, national self-determination, and a league of nations. Points one through five aim to remove causes of war, Points one through five called for no secret treaties, freedom of the seas, reduction of barriers to trade, reduction of armaments, and adjustment of colonial claims based partly on the interests of colonial peoples. Point six called for other nations to withdraw from Russian territory and to welcome Russia into the society of free nations. Points seven through 13 addressed particular situations, return of territories France had lost to Germany in 1871 and self-determination in Central Europe and the Middle East. The 14th point called for a general association of nations that would become the League of Nations that could afford mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. Showing little enthusiasm, the Allies accepted Wilson's 14 points as starting points for discussion. When the Germans asked for an end to the fighting, however, they made it clear that their request was based on the 14 points. The peace conference and the treaty. Considering the questions, how successful was Wilson at the peace conference and what caused the defeat of the treaty? With the war over, Wilson hoped the, police, the peace process would not sell the seeds of future wars. He hoped to, to create an international organization to keep the peace. The Allies, however, were more interested in grabbing territory or in punishing Germany. In December of 1918, the world in 1919. In December of 1918, Wilson sailed for Europe, the first American president to go to Europe while in office and the first to negotiate directly with other world leaders. Wilson brought reports from experts on European history, culture, ethnology, and geography who had been working since the fall of 1917 on plans for the post-war era. Ethnology, by the way, is defined as the study of ethno-cultural groups. In France, Italy, and Britain, huge welcoming crowds cheered the great, quote, peacemaker from America. Delegates to the peace conference assembled amid the collapse of ancient empires and the birth of new republics. The Austro-Hungarian Empire had crumbled, producing the new nations of Poland and Czechoslovakia and the republics of Austria and Hungary. The German monarch, Kaiser Wilhelm, had abdicated and a republic was forming. In January 1919, communists tried unsuccessfully to seize power in Berlin. Throughout the, throughout the ruins of the Russian Empire, ethnic groups were proclaiming independent republics. Most were eventually incorporated into the Soviet Union, often by the Bolsheviks as Red Army. The Ottoman Empire was collapsing too as Arabs with aid from Britain and France overthrew Turkish rule in many areas. Throughout Europe and the Middle East, national self-determination and sometimes government by the consent of the governed, part of Wilson's goal for the post-war world, seemed to be lurching into reality. Nor were the British and French colonial empires immune for both faced growing independence movements among their many possessions. In Russia, civil war raged between the Bolsheviks and their opponents called the Whites. When the Bolsheviks with the Red Army left the World War, the Allies pushed Wilson to join them in intervening in Russia, ostensibly to protect war supplies from falling into German hands. In mid-1918, Wilson sent American troops as part of Allied expeditions to Northern Russia and Eastern Siberia. In Siberia, his intent was primarily to head off a Japanese grab of Russian territory. Allied intervention soon changed to support for the Whites. By late 1918, Wilson was expressing concern over what he called mass terrorism directed by the Bolsheviks toward peaceable Russian citizens. Before the last American troops withdrew from northern Russia in May 1919 and from eastern Siberia in early 1920, they had engaged in conflict with units of the Red Army. And I can't help but ask, is this a precursor in some fashion to the Cold War? In the wider world, civil war in Russia 1918 and 1920. 
After the Bolsheviks took power in Russia in November of 1917, the first significant opposition developed in southern Russia, led by former army officers. In January 1918, the Bolshe Bolsheviks disbanded the elected constituent assembly and excluded from power members of the largest political party, the socialist revolutionaries, the SRs or moderate socialists, sending many SRs into opposition. The humiliating treaty of Brest-Litovsk pushed Russian, more Russians into opposition. By mid-1918, white or anti-Bolshevik armies controlled much of southern Russia, all of Siberia, and small areas elsewhere and seemed to be threatening Moscow. Several nations had troops in Russia, but nearly all the fighting was by Russians against Russians, and much of it was exceptionally brutal. Britain provided more supplies for the whites than any other source outside of Russia. The Bolsheviks Red Army fought back, emerging victorious late in 1920. During the Civil War, the Bolshevik secret police, the Cheka, carried out a Red Terror that included perhaps 250,000 executions of those they considered enemies of the people. The opposing armies ravaged large areas of the Russian countryside and casualties exceeded 1.2 million on both sides. Drought and disease compounded the devastation of war, especially in Southern Russia, producing an estimated 7 million homeless children. Wilson at Versailles. The peace conference opened on January 18th, 1919, just outside of Paris at the glittering Palace of Versailles, once home to French kings. Representatives attended from all nations that had declared war against the central powers, but major decisions were made by the big four, Wilson, David Lloyd George of Britain, George Clemenceau of France, and Vittorio Orlando of Italy. Germany was excluded. Terms of peace were to be imposed, not negotiated. Russia too was absent since Lenin had withdrawn from the war and made a separate peace with Germany, that Treaty of brest -Litovsk. Wilson quickly realized that European leaders were focused on their own national interests, not his 14 points. Clemenceau, nicknamed the Tiger, remembered Germany's humiliating defeat of France in 1871 and hoped to disable Germany so it could never again threaten his nation. Lloyd George agreed with many of Wilson's goals, but felt he carried orders from British voters to exact heavy reparations from Germany. Reparations, by the way, are payments as compensation for damages, usually during war, definitely know that term. Orlando from Italy and other allies were still expecting to gain the territories promised to them in these secret treaties. The European allies favored the spread of Bolshevism and intended to create buffer states to keep it at bay. Facing the insistent and acquisitive allies, Wilson had to compromise. He did secure a League of Nations. Instead of peace without victory, however, the Treaty of Versailles imposed harsh victor's terms, requiring Germany to accept the blame for starting the war, pay reparations to the Allies, exact amounts to be determined later, and surrender all its colonies along with the Alsace-Lorraine, which Germany had taken from France in 1871 and other European territories. The treaty also deprived Germany of its Navy and Merchant Marine and limited its army to 100,000 men. German representatives signed this on June 28th of 1919. Wilson reluctantly agreed to the reparations, but insisted that colonies taken from Germany and territories taken from the Ottoman Empire should not go permanently to the Allies. Called mandates, they were to be administered by one of the Allies on behalf of the League of Nations and were to move toward independence. In nearly every case, however, the mandate went to the nations slated to receive the territory under the secret treaties. Wilson blocked Italy's most extreme territorial demands, but gave in on others. That actually motivates Italy to join World War II later. By the way, I hope you have World War II in the back of your head as we're going through all of this, because so much of this sets the scene for World War II in different ways. So if you need to rewind even and listen to the last few minutes, I would recommend doing that. It's going to make the next, you know, 30 years in world history make a little bit more sense. The peace conference recognized new republics through Central Europe, thereby creating a so-called quarantine zone between Russian Bolshevism and Western Europe. The treaty ignored those people from Ireland to Vietnam seeking self-determination for colonies held by one of the allies. Japan tried but failed to secure a statement supporting racial equality. Though Wilson compromised on most of his 14 points, every compromise intensified his commitment to the League of Nations. The League, he hoped, would resolve future controversies without war and also solve problems created by the compromises. Even so, Wilson had to threaten a separate peace with Germany before the Allies agreed to incorporate the League Covenant into the treaty. The League Covenant, by the way, is the Constitution of the League of Nations, part of the 1919 Treaty of Versailles. Wilson was especially committed to Article 10 of the League, League Covenant. He called it the League's heart. It specified that League members agreed to protect one another's independence and territory against external attacks and to take joint action against aggressors. It matters today, redrawing the map of the Middle East. Several current nations in the Middle East arose from agreements reached during World War I or at Versailles. During the war, Britain assisted Arabs to revolt against the Ottoman Empire and promised them an independent Arab state. However, at the same time, Britain and France, with the ascent of Russia, secretly divided much of the Ottoman Empire between them. 
Further complicating matters was a wartime British promise that Palestine would be a future Jewish homeland, talking about the Balfour Declaration there. Britain and France subsequently, subsequently withdrew the boundaries of the League mandates for Iraq, Syria, Palestine, and Transjordan, now Jordan, but not based on Wilson's goal of self-determination. Britain received Iraq, Palestine, and Transjordan. France received Syria, which included Lebanon. The French divided Syria into administrative regions based on the dominant religion in each area, setting up separate units for Alawite Muslims, an offshoot of Shia Islam, Sunni Muslims, Druze, and Maronite Christians, the last of which later became the core of the separate state of Lebanon. Throughout the French Mandate period, the various religious groups remained anxious regarding their future relations with each other once, those, uh, once the French left. And if you want, you can consider, how do decisions made at Versailles influence world affairs today? And if you want, you can do more research on Syria and Lebanon from 1920 onward. Why do you find in that, or what do you find in that history that helps you understand Syria's civil war beginning of 2011 and the long-term civil strife in Lebanon? The Senate and the Treaty. When Wilson was in Paris, opposition to his plans was brewing at home. The Senate, controlled by Republicans since the 1918 elections, had to approve any treaty. Presented with the treaty, the Senate split into three groups. Henry Cabot Lodge, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, led the largest faction called Reservationists after the reservations or amendments to the treaty that Lodge developed. Article 10 of the League Covenant especially bothered Lodge, for he feared that it might commit American troops to war without congressional approval. A small group called Irreconcilables, mostly Republicans, opposed any American involvement in European affairs. A third Senate group, nearly all Democrats, supported the president and his treaty. Wilson decided to appeal directly to the American people. In September of 1919, he undertook an arduous speaking tour, 9,500 miles with speeches in 29 cities. The effort proved too demanding for his fragile health. Soon after, he suffered a serious stroke. Half paralyzed and weak, Wilson could fulfill few duties. His wife, Edith Bowling Wilson, exercised what she later called a stewardship, directly limiting her ailing husband's contact with the outside world. Lodge proposed that the Senate accept the treaty with his amendments. Some were minor, but others would have permitted Congress to block action under Article 10. Wilson refused any compromise. On November 19, 1919, the Senate defeated the treaty with the Lodge reservations by votes of 39 to 55 and 41 to 50, with the irreconcilables joining the president's supporters in opposition. Then the Senate defeated the unamended treaty by 38 to 53, with the irreconcilables joining the reservationists in voting no. The treaty came to a vote again in March of 1920. Some treaty supporters concluded that the League could never be approved without Lodge's amendments, so they joined the reservationists to produce 49 fa in favor to 35 opposed, still short of the two-thirds majority required. Enough Wilson loyalists, following their stubborn leader's order not to compromise, basically they're not going to vote on any bill that has any compromise in it, joined the irreconcilables to defeat the treaty once again. The U.S. did not join the League of Nations. Legacies of the Great War. Wilson had reflected progressives' optimism and confidence in claiming that the U.S. was going to make the world safe for democracy. One of his supporters even spoke of the war to end war. Just as progressives defined their domestic policies in terms of progress, democracy, and social justice, so Wilson tried to invest his foreign, foreign policy with enlightened values. In doing so, however, he fostered unrealistic expectations that world politics might be transformed overnight. Many Americans became disillusioned by the Allies' cynical opportunism. The war to make the world safe for democracy ended up with Italy annexing Austrian territory and Japan seizing German concessions in China. The war to end war actually spun off several wars in its wake. Romania invaded Hungary in 1919, Poland invaded Russia in 1920, the Russian Civil War continued until late 1920, and Greece and Turkey battled until 1923. So is this really a war to make the world safe for democracy, or is it really a war to end war? I mean, apparently not. The peace conference left many problems unresolved. Wilson's promotion of self-government and self-determination encouraged aspirations for independence throughout the Allies' as colonies and among the new League mandates. Some of the new nations of Central Europe, supposedly based on ethnic self-determination, actually included different and sometimes antagonistic ethnic groups. Above all, the war and the treaty contributed to economic and political instability in much of Europe, making it a breeding ground for totalitarian and nationalistic movements that eventually generated another world war. America in the aftermath of war, November 1918 to November of 1920. Considering the questions, how did Americans react to the outcome of the war and the events of 1919, and how did the events of 1917 to 20 affect the 1920 presidential election? Almost as soon as French church bells pealed for the armistice, the US began to demobilize. Industrial demobilization occurred almost immediately as officials canceled war contracts. 
1919, American troops came back from Europe, nearly 4 million men and women returned to civilian life, and the nation experienced raging inflation, massive strikes, bloody race riots, widespread fear of radical subversion, violations of civil liberties, the two new constitutional amendments that embodied important elements of progressivism, prohibition and women's suffrage. Sounds like a really fun time. HCL and strikes. Inflation, described in newspapers as HCL for the high cost of living, was the most pressing single problem Americans faced after the war. Between 1913 and 1919, prices almost doubled. Freed from their wartime no-strike pledge, unions made wage demands to match the soaring cost of living. In 1919, however, employers were ready for a fight. Many companies wanted to return labor relations to pre-war patterns. Sorry. They blamed wage increases for inflation, and some tried to link unions to Bolshevism. In February of 1919, Seattle's Central Labor, Count Central Labor Council called out the city's unions in a five-day general strike to support shipyard workers. The mayor branded it a Bolshevik plot. Boston's police struck in September of 1919 after the police commissioner fired 19 policemen for joining a union. The governor of Massachusetts, future president Calvin Coolidge, called out the National Guard to maintain order and to break the union. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime, he proclaimed. By mid-1919, many unionists concluded that conservative politicians were joining business leaders to roll back unions' wartime gains and to block new organizing. The largest and most dramatic strike came against United States Steel. Few steel workers were represented by unions after the 1892 Homestead strike. Steel companies often hired recent immigrants, keeping steel workers divided by language. Most steel workers put in 12 hour workdays. Wages lagged far behind inflation and company profits. In 19, 1919, the AFL launched an ambitious unionization drive in the steel industry and many steel workers responded eagerly. Steel industry leaders refused to deal with the new organization that was so popular. The workers went on strike in late September, demanding union recognition, collective bargaining, the eight hour workday and higher wages. The company blamed the strike on radicals and mobilized public opinion against the strikers. Company guards protected strike breakers and US military forces moved into Gary, Indiana to help round up the red element. By January of 1920, after 18 workers had been killed and hundreds had been beaten, the strike was over and the unions were ousted, meaning the unions were kind of broken and kicked out. The Red Scare, or the first Red Scare of two. The steel industry's charges of Bolshevism to discredit strikers came as many government and corporate leaders were declaiming against the dangers of Bolshevism at home and abroad. Then, in late 19, April 1919, 34 bombs addressed to prominent Americans, including J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, were discovered in various post offices after the explosion of two others addressed to a senator and Seattle's mayor. In June, bombs in several cities damaged buildings and killed two people. Though the work of a few anarchists, the bombs fueled fears of a nationwide radical conspiracy. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer organized an anti-red campaign, hoping that success might bring him the 1920 presidential nomination. Like a prairie fire, Palmer claimed, the blaze of revolution was sweeping over every American institution. He appointed J. Edgar Hoover, a young lawyer, to head an anti-radical unit in the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation, the predecessor of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In November of 1919, Palmer launched what were soon called the Palmer Raids, definitely know the Palmer Raids folks, to arrest suspected radicals. Although officials found few firearms and no explosives, they rounded up some 5,000 people by January of 1920, of whom several hundred radical aliens were deported. The rest were released. State legislatures also produced anti-radical measures, especially criminal syndical syndicalism laws, measures criminalizing the advocacy of Bolshevik, IWW, or anarchist ideologies. In January of 1920, the New York State Legislature expelled five members elected as socialists solely because they were socialists. So here now it's a crime to be a socialist and it's a crime to advocate for different things like the wobblies or to, you know, be an anarchist. It's literally against the law. When a wide range of respected public figures denounced the legislature's actions as undemocratic, public opinion regarding the Red Scare began to shift. With the approach of May 1st, a day of celebration for radicals, Palmer dramatically warned of a general strike and bombings. When nothing happened, many concluded that the radical socialist threat might have been overstated. As the Red Scare sputtered to an end, in May of 1920, police in Massachusetts arrested Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, Italian-born anarchists, and charged them with robbery and murder. Despite inconclusive evidence and the men's protestations of innocence, a jury found them guilty and they were sentenced to death. Many argued they had not received a fair trial and had been convicted because of their political beliefs and their Italian origins. 
Over loud protests at home and abroad, both men were executed in 1927. Historians continue to debate the evidence, many arguing that Sacco was probably guilty and Vanzetti innocent, and others insisting that both were innocent and that the state police concealed evidence. Modern ballistics evidence indicates that they did possess a gun used in the crime. Do some more research if you really want to find out some more about it. Race riots and lynchings. The racial tensions of the warriors continued into the post-war period. Black soldiers encountered less discrimination in Europe than they had ever known at home. In May of 1919, the NAACP journal Crisis expressed what the more militant returning soldiers felt. We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. Make way for democracy. We saved it in France, and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the USA or know the reason why. Some whites, however, greeted returning Black troops with furious violence intended to restore pre-war race relations. Southern mobs lynched 10 Black soldiers, some still in uniform. In all, rioters lynched more than 70 Blacks in the first year after the war and burned 11 victims alive. Rioting also struck outside the South. In July of 1919, violence reached the nation's capital, where white mobs, including soldiers and sailors, attacked Blacks over three days, killing several. The city's African Americans organized their own defense, sometimes arming themselves. In Chicago in late July, war raged between white and Black mobs for nearly two weeks, despite efforts by the National Guard. The rioting caused 38 deaths, 15 white, 23 black. A thousand families, nearly all black, were burned out of their homes. In Omaha in September, a mob tried to hang the mayor when he bravely stood between them and a black prisoner accused of rape. Police saved the mayor, but not the prisoner. By the end of 1919, race riots had flared in more than two dozen places. The year saw not only rampant lynchings, but also the appearance of a new Ku Klux Klan discussed in the next chapter. Despite violence and coercion directed at African Americans, some things had changed. As W.E.B. Du Bois observed, Black veterans would never be the same again. You cannot ask them to go back to what they were before. They cannot, for they are not the same men. We're going to see that same process of serving and then returning and advocating for change happen during and after World War II. Amending the Constitution, Prohibition, and Women's Suffrage. At the end of the war, two of the great campaigns of the Progressive Era finally realized their goals. Both had roots in the 19th century, both attracted numerous supporters during the Progressive Era, and both received a boost from the war. Prohibition was adopted as the 18th Amendment, and women's suffrage became the 19th Amendment. Pushed by the Anti-Saloon League, Congress passed a temporary prohibition measure in 1917. A more important victory came when Congress adopted and sent to the states the 18th Amendment, prohibiting the manufacture, sale, or transportation of alcoholic beverages. Intense and single-minded lobbying persuaded three-fourths of the state legislatures to ratify the amendment in 1919, and it took effect in January of 1920. The cause of women's suffrage also received a boost from the war, as suffrage advocates added women's contributions to the war effort to their previous arguments. Basically, women were able to help out with the war, so shouldn't women then have a claim to voting? We contributed to the nation in that way. Can't we get the vote? In June of 1919, by a narrow margin, Congress proposed the 19th Amendment to enfranchise women and sent it to the states for ratification. After a grueling state-by-state -state battle, ratification finally came in August of 1920. Although many women by then already exercised the franchise, especially in Western states, ratification meant that the electorate for the 1920 elections was significantly expanded. The election of 1920. Republicans confidently expected to regain the White House in 1920. Democrats had lost their congressional majorities in the 1918 elections, and post-war misgivings and disillusionment often focused on Wilson. One reporter described the stricken president as the sacrificial whipping boy for the present bitterness. Any competent Republican nominee was practically guaranteed election. Several candidates attracted significant support, notably former Army Chief of Staff General Leonard Wood, Illinois Governor Frank Lowden, and California Senator Hiram Johnson, but no candidate counted a majority in the convention. Months earlier, Harry Doherty, campaign manager for Ohio Senator Warren G. Harding, had foreseen a deadlock and had predicted that it would be broken at about 11 minutes after 2 o'clock in the morning, when 15 or 20 men, bleary-eyed and perspiring profusely, picked a promising a compromise candidate. And so it was. A small group of party leaders met late at night in a smoke-filled hotel room and picked Harding. Even some of his supporters were unenthusiastic. One called him the best of the second raiders. For vice president, the Republicans nominated Calvin Coolidge, the governor who broke the Boston police strike. The Democrats also suffered severe divisions. After 44 ballots, they chose James Cox, governor of Ohio, as their presidential candidate. For vice president, they nominated Franklin D. Roosevelt, Wilson's assistant secretary of the Navy and a remote cousin of Theodore Roosevelt. 
described as good natured and likable, and sometimes as bumbling, Harding had published a small town newspaper in Ohio until his wife, Florence, and some friends pushed him into politics. Eventually winning election to the Senate, unhappy with his marriage, Harding apparently took pleasure from a series of mistresses. The press knew of Harding's li liaisons, but never reported them. What a different time for the media. During the 1920 campaign, an uproar arose over a claim that Harding's ancestry included African Americans. When a reporter asked Harding, do you have any Negro blood? Harding replied mildly, how do I know, Jim? One of my ancestors may have jumped the fence. DNA analysis in 2015 showed that Harding had no black ancestry. The allegation and Harding's response to it apparently did little to hurt his cause. Most of Harding's campaign reflected his promise to, quote, return to normalcy. After the stress of the war and post-war years, voters enthusiastically endorsed returning to normalcy. Harding took 37 of the 48 states and 60% of the popular vote, the largest popular majority up to that time. Wilson hoped for a solemn referendum on the League of Nations, but the election proved more a reaction against the war launched with lofty ideals that turned sour at Versailles, the high cost of living, and the strikes and riots of 1919. Americans, it seemed, had had enough of idealism and sacrifice for a while. The election of 1920 is really a big response to progressivism too. Progressivism, you might remember, sought to change things. Here, there's going to be this return to normalcy, and the American people are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly going to vote in favor of maybe not doing as much progressive stuff at this point. Individual voices, Woodrow Wilson proposes his 14th Amendment, 14 points, excuse me. President Woodrow Wilson spoke to a joint session of Congress on January 8, 1918, and presented his objectives for peace, including his 14 points. This is a condensed version of that speech. Historians understand that Wilson was writing to persuade many audiences, Congress, the American people, the allies, the central powers, and later historians. It will be our wish and purpose that the processes of peace when they are begun shall be absolutely open. The day of conquest and aggrandizement is gone by. So is also the day of secret treaties. What we demand in this war is that the world be made fit and safe to live in, and particularly that it be made safe for every peace-loving nation which, like our own, wishes to live its own life, determine its own institutions, be assured of justice and fair dealing by the other people of the world as against force and selfish aggression. All the peoples of the world are, in effect, partners in this interest. The program of the world's peace, therefore, is our program. And that program, the only possible program as we see it, is this. One, open covenants of peace openly arrived at, after which there shall be no private international understandings of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. Two, absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas outside territorial waters. Three, the removal so far as possible of all economic barriers and the establishment of an equality of trade conditions among all the nations, talking about free trade right there. Four, adequate guarantees given and taken that national armaments will be reduced to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. Five, a free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. And then point six through 13 laid out specific territorial restorations or adjustments. And finally, point number 14, a general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. For such arrangements and covenants, we are willing to fight and to continue to fight until they are achieved, but only because we wish the right to prevail and desire a just and stable peace such as can be secured only by removing the chief provocations to war. Basically, they're trying to take away any reasons that someone would have to go to war, trying to prevent war from emerging in the future. An evident principle runs through the whole program I have outlined. It is the principle of justice to all peoples and nationalities and the right to live on equal terms of liberty and safety with one another, whether they be strong or weak. The people of the US could act upon no other principle. The moral climax of this culminating and final war for human liberty has come. Compare that with the experiences of black soldiers in France. Just saying. Summary, Woodrow Wilson took office expecting to focus on domestic policy, not world affairs. He fulfilled some Democratic Party commitments to anti-imperialism, but intervened extensively in the Caribbean. He also intervened in Mexico, but failed to accomplish all of his objectives there. When war broke out in Europe in 1914, Wilson declared that the US uh, would be neutral, and most Americans agreed. German submarine warfare and British restrictions on commerce, however, threatened traditional definitions of neutrality. Wilson secured a German pledge to refrain from unrestricted submarine warfare. He was re-elected in 1916 on the argument that he kept us out of war. Shortly after he won re-election, though, the Germans violated their pledge, and in April of 1917, Wilson asked for war against Germany, and remember, unrestricted submarine warfare is the biggest reason for that. 
the war changed most aspects of America's economic and social life. The federal government developed a high degree of centralized economic planning and tried to mold public opinion and to restrict dissent. Think of the Creel Committee, think of the War Industries Board, the NWLB. When the federal government backed collective bargaining, unions registered important gains. In response to labor shortages, more women and African Americans entered the industrial workforce and many African Americans moved to northern and midwestern industrial cities in the Great Migration. Germany launched an offensive in 1918, hoping to achieve a victory before the Americans could make a difference. However, the AEF helped to break the German advance and the Germans surrendered. In his 14 points, Wilson expressed his goals for peace and for the League of Nations. Facing opposition from the Allies, Wilson compromised at the Versailles Peace Conference, but hoped that the League of Nations would maintain the peace. Fearing obligations that League membership might place on the US, enough senators opposed the treaty, thanks to the help of uh, you know, Henry Cabot Lodge. Um, most senators, or excuse me, enough senators opposed the treaty to defeat it. Thus, the US did not become a member of the League. The end of the war brought disillusionment and high prices, and many strikes, a red scare, and race riots and lynchings. In 1920, the nation returned to its previous Republican majority when it elected Warren G. Harding, a mediocre conservative, to the White House.